already hungry, even just introing this segment. Take us into the quarter, some of the catalysts that stuck out from your perspective. Well, great to be on with you, and uh, th thanks for the opportunity to tell our story. Obviously, we had a really, really strong quarter in Q1. This was our third consecutive quarter of double-digit system sales for Yum! across the world. Um, but it wasn't you know, just at the high level, it was also within each of our brands, so it was widespread. Each of our three brands had double-digit system sales growth in their businesses. We had double-digit growth in our core operating profit, and then we saw a massive increase in the number I track very closely, and that's our digital sales. Our digital sales went from $6 billion last year at the same time to $7 billion this year driven by a lot of investment and our digital strategies uh, in the field clearly working. Uh, that's double digit all everywhere I look and it adds up to a great quarter for us. Um, you also saw double digit margin, 14.9% you know, was the margin, but that trailed estimates a little bit as did the earnings per share. Um, talk us through that, what, what happened there versus expectations. I think it was a, a strong quarter uh, and, and once you unpack the numbers and every measure. In terms of our, our store level margin, which is what really matters, how our franchisees profitability is working, you know, Taco Bell is our biggest business in the U.S., uh, where most of our store margin comes from. Uh, you know, we've consistently had mid low 20s to mid 20s store level margins at Taco Bell, another quarter with uh, similar margins. Um, and actually margins are up at the store level from 2022 at Taco Bell. Uh, so the profitability there is there for our franchise partners and it is translating into profit for us. You know, we, as I mentioned, we grew our core operating profit. Uh, once you adjust for things like foreign exchange, um, up 11%. So, uh, you know, profitability uh, clearly was uh, a big part of the story this quarter. We're pleased with how those sales flew through. And it seems like value was a large focus of this quarter as well. In the call, you noted that it seems like you have the tools to win in this sort of environment. Break down for us what sort of trends you're seeing, particularly when it comes to low income consumers. You know, we're obviously seeing what I would call more of a return to normal from a consumer standpoint, and that means people care a little bit more about value than they have you know, over the last few years, maybe when they were a little more flush um, with money in their pocket. Um, we have always flourished in that kind of environment, particularly because Taco Bell makes up 75% of our profitability in the United States, and that brand has always been a value leader. It's been a leader on convenience and value and delicious food and great experiences for consumers. Taco Bell has what we call the $2 cravings menu, which uh, allows just about everybody to access the brand. Um, but they also offer higher end value, like the grilled cheese burrito, uh, for those people that may be trading into the category and into Taco Bell, um, and trying uh, uh, and trading da out of the fast casual category, for example. Uh, so Taco Bell has something to offer for everybody, but it's not just Taco Bell. Uh, Pizza Hut in the quarter um, put up a really strong number in the U.S. driven by the Melts business that they launched uh, at the end of last year that had a fir its first full quarter. That's a $6.99 product that's a great value. It's you know, designed for one, but big enough for two. Uh, so feeding two for $6.99 really works well. And then KFC, uh, in the end of the quarter, launched what we call $5 wrap deal. It's two wraps for $5. That really moved the needle when it came to low-income consumers. In fact, the strongest part of their sales growth for the quarter in the U.S. was from those lower-income consumers. So we're not seeing an environment from a consumer standpoint where we can't drive transaction growth and drive sales. David, I'm definitely in the Brad camp now. I'm hungry. Um, so talk to me about how all of this relates to your pricing strategy. We've been talking pricing with everybody. It's really a hot topic right now. And a lot of uh, whether you're talking about packaged good companies or personal care companies or restaurant chains like yourselves, everyone's taking price. It sounds like, though, you guys are taking price maybe in certain areas, but you also want to still provide value. So how is that strategy playing out right now? And then how's it going to play out for the rest of the year? Look, uh, first and foremost, um, taking price is a last resort for us. We want to be the convenience and value option for consumers. Um, but at the same time, we've got to preserve our franchisee profitability. And historically, our industry has been able to pass price increases along to consumers if they're done smartly. That's why we did the acquisition of a company uh, called Quantum, for example, that um, does a lot of data and analytics work for our franchise partners to help figure out the rice pricing constructs in markets around the world. So we're taking price where we um, where consumers can afford it, 
but we're still remaining great value for those that need to access other parts of our menu. That whole formula of being very smart about we, how we take price is really working for us. It's best exemplified you know, at Taco Bell where they have their $2 value menu, which makes the brand accessible to everybody. But there are other versions of that uh, really all around the world where we're very sharp and ver very uh, thoughtful about how we take price and where we do it and when. As we enter into 2023, uh, I do not anticipate taking as much price in 2023 as we did in 2022, um, simply because inflation has abated for us in terms of our key input costs on the food side, and even the labor market has gotten a lot better. We now have mm -hmm. more applications, more team members in stores, better staff stores. And it was a pretty stellar quarter for Pizza Hut, particularly in the U.S. Total sales accounted for 41% in the U.S. here. Do you think that you're taking market share from perhaps local pizza merchants or consumers trading to Pizza Hut? Uh, there's no doubt that right now in the in the U.S. pizza market, Pizza Hut is winning and stealing share from others. And I'm proud of the work the team has done. And it's because of all the strategies that they've been working on for the last few years coming to fruition. Uh, we've embraced using aggregators, for example, where some of our competitors have not. That's provided us incremental sales. Um, you know, we've offered products like the melts, which appeal to a different consumer than the typical pizza consumer. So that's bringing in new consumers. It's bringing them in on different occasions. That's more of a lunch product, for example. So we have lots of things going on at Pizza Hut that are driving incrementality, and it all added up to a great quarter for them and no doubt stealing market share from others. And another buzzword that we've been hearing this earnings season is AI. I know that you mentioned it on the call. You're investing heavily in it, whether it's Dragon Tail, TikTok, if I said that right, recommended ordering. Break down how this is boosting productivity and profit for franchisees. Uh, we've done a lot of work with tech technology, made a lot of investments in technology, and this is a strategy that has been going on for many years. This is nothing new. Um, we're now just starting to see the fruits of it and how it's really paying off for our franchise partners. When we use technology to make our restaurants more efficient, for example, we bought a company called Dragon Tail that um, really improves the efficiency of how we sequence orders in a restaurant and how we use drivers on the road. When we do that, it has benefits to everybody. The franchisees get benefits because the efficiency of their team members goes up. Uh, the customer gets a benefit because they get a hotter, fresher product because we're better able to time when their product's made and when a delivery driver gets there to take it to the customer. <clears throat> and really, uh, using technology for things like ordering um, benefits the customer and us. They, we end up with a higher average ticket. It's an easier way to order through e-commerce channels or even kiosks in our stores like we have at Taco Bell now in the U.S. Um, so the technology story is long, wide, and deep, and it uh, is impacting every single part of our business. David, while we think about how historical that delivery has been with, with pizza, there are other parts and, and brands and operations within your business that rely on or use third-party delivery services as well to engage with your end consumer and that customer who's you know just looking to get, a, get fed for lunch or for dinner. How much of that interaction and of that customer's data are you able to hold on to to then turn into other types of touch points with that customer and, and ultimately monetize that customer even more? Obviously, um, when we have customers opt into our loyalty programs, in which we have a lot of, um, we have great access to their data and we formed a great relationship with them. And we see that driving incrementality every time we get a customer into the loyalty program. Um, as far as the, all of the data we have, even if you look at it at an anonymous basis, um, we can draw a lot of conclusions about customer behavior and traffic patterns that can help us. What kinds of things are they more likely to add on on what parts on certain times of the day? You know, what products really resonate with uh, in different countries that you know, maybe don't work in other countries? You know, that's why we've been leaning so heavily on the data and the analytics side of the business, doing a lot of external acquisitions to shore up our capabilities there. You know, at the end of the day, Yum! is the largest restaurant company in the world with over 55,000 restaurants. We, could, we should be, and we are, the leader when it comes to technology in the restaurant industry. We had 45% of our sales were through digital channels uh, in this past quarter, a new record for us on mix, and a new record from a number standpoint at $7 billion. There's sort of the technology that you're talking about, and then there's the sort of 
harder to, I don't know, quantify or number crunch. I'm talking about TikTok because um, recently there was a viral challenge that claimed falsely, by the way, that if people could finish a bucket of your chicken in 60 minutes, they could come and get a free refill. You guys then offered a, a sort of related promotion. Like, how do you think about that kind of strategy, which again is... Um, more art than science, I'm guessing. And what kind of team do you have devoted to sort of tracking those kinds of trends? Well, of course, uh, uh, digital and our brand's reputation and how we connect to consumers on those channels is absolutely critical to us. You know, we have brands that are 60, 70 years old, but they remain forever young because of the way we show up and the consumer interest we have in those channels. Um, yeah, and you mentioned one example, but there's a, a you know a thousand of them. You remember last year, uh, we had Dolly Parton and Doja Cat uh, oh, getting yeah. on social media pleading for us to bring back the Mexican mm-hmm. pizza. Uh, it's probably the best example of how social media can help our business. Um, we ended up partnering with them and brought it back uh, to great fanfare and great results. Um, but each of our brands uh, does have teams of people devoted to social, monitoring what's being discussed, making sure we're interacting with customers in a way that's consistent with our, our brand and how we want to treat customers and using social to really amplify our message. That was quite the partnership between Tennessee's finest and the Met Gala's finest teaming up. <laughs> um, you know, ultimately here, David, when we think about the times of day that you're engaging with consumers, I want to talk about the share of breakfast. Where do you see Yum! Brands excelling and where would you like to invest more in getting a share of that breakfast portion of the day? Well, breakfast is certainly an important part of the roadmap for KFC and Taco Bell brands. Um, Taco Bell you know, launched breakfast many years ago in the U.S. and it's been a slow but steady build. Uh, they've been leaning in it more recently, uh, using some celebrity spokespeople to get a lot of attention in the marketplace. Uh, and KFC, you know, for example, just launched uh, breakfast in South Africa. I saw some of the ads for that that look fantastic. So uh, certainly our, our challenge as leaders of these amazing brands is to constantly be finding new ways to connect with, with consumers and new occasions that we might not currently be serving. You saw that in a big way over the last few years when it came to off-premise with delivery and carryout. You know, Taco Bell's off-premise business went, or delivery business um, went from zero to, you know, uh, 20 something percent overnight um, as we really leaned in and leveraged the, the technologies and the strategies that we had uh, at the brand to, to uh, service delivery. But uh, you could say that about any occasion that we're not part of, and breakfast is certainly one of them. And uh, we're proud of the progress we're making at Taco Bell in the US and around the world with KFC. Um, all of our stomachs are growling as we are talking here on set. David, it's great to catch up with you as always. Thanks so much for making some time for us. Young Brand CEO David Gibbs and our Brooke De Palma as well. Thank you.